I know there's a lot of pain out there. I know there's pain inside our church. And I know there's pain, a lot of pain outside of our church. I know that these are painful times and uncertain times, difficult times, disease and fire-stricken times. You know, a lot of tears. I've seen them. But the tears are temporary. And the grace and the deliverance of God is forever. As we open Isaiah, as we study it in groups, as we follow along together in a reading plan, if you're not a part of that, look that up today. Join in with the rest of the church family. As you read Isaiah and you get to chapter 24 in particular, it's like you've finally put the kids to bed and the fireplace is waiting there to kindly warm your feet right next to your favorite chair and you get like the extra fuzzy blanket that everybody in the family covets. Do you guys have one of those? We do. And you've got it all to yourself. It hugs you in your comfy chair. The steam quietly rises from your favorite oversized mug full of decaf coffee. Your pet velociraptor, Hank, purrs at your feet. Your trusty lamp stands at attention behind you, giving you just the right amount of light to read. You breathe in, you sigh out the stresses of the day, and it's time to read. But suddenly, you're stricken with horror when the darkly meta book that you're reading begins to describe the very room that you're sitting in. This is what happens when you read Isaiah and you get to chapter 24, because all the while Isaiah has been prophesying to Judah about God's coming discipline using Assyria, Egypt, Moab, and then God's coming retribution even for those nations themselves. But now in chapter 24, he's talking about all nations. He's talking about the whole world. And that's us today. Yes, at this juncture in Isaiah, the text becomes apocalyptic in nature. Now, I know that's a touchy subject. Okay, my skeptical friend, I'm going to tell you something about Christian culture. Like, we feel weird talking about the apocalypse because we don't want to come across as kooky to you, right? No, I don't have a bomb shelter like with a pinball machine in it. Maybe that'd be fun. We don't want to talk about it because we don't want to come across as weird. And the main thing that we're all about is just, it's about Jesus. Just sharing the word of God, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But a part of it is this prophecy that's in the Bible about how all of this ends. Now, to be fair, my skeptical friend, my atheist friend, like you've got to also concede here because you have your own apocalypse. All right, go with me on this. G2 dwarf stars in their main phase eventually become supernovas. And our sun in our solar system is just such a G2 dwarf star. It has a finite lifespan. It's going to explode one day. And that's not going to be good for your lawn when that happens. I mean, so even if you're an atheist, you still adhere to some form of apocalyptic view. I mean, I certainly hear a lot of apocalyptic prophecies coming regarding climate change. So I know that Christians aren't the only ones who believe that all of this comes to an end. But here's the difference. There is beautiful, exquisite, promised hope in the Christian view of how God will bring the final reckoning upon evil forever. And he himself, the Lord God, will wipe away the tears from the eyes of his people. Now, that's not an argument for the credibility of Scripture, but it is an invitation to you. Would you hear what the Bible has to say? about how this all ends. And would you be a part of that blessed, beautiful hope? This is Isaiah. Chapter 24 describes this coming judgment for all nations. Chapter 25 describes God's promise to destroy death forever, and wipe the tears from the eyes of his people. As you've gone through Isaiah, you've seen the various nations on the world stage at play. He is talking to real live kings in his prophecy. He, we saw in the very opening in chapter one, the kings of Judah to whom he prophesied. And what's fascinating is that that also is consistent with what we see in other books of the Bible, like 2 Kings 19 and 20. Isaiah appears in the historical books of 2 Kings. 
And it's like reading a Stephen King book and seeing one character from one book show up in another, or like a David Mitchell book where characters appear in multiple books, only this is nonfiction. This is real. Isaiah is in the book of 2 Kings in chapters 19 and 20. It's like seeing Professor Sybil Trelawney, Emma Thompson's frizzy-haired and massively bespectacled character in the Harry Potter movies showing up somehow in The Crimes of Grindelwald, this prequel. 2 Kings 19 and 20, Isaiah was semi-comforting King Hezekiah because King Hezekiah had reason to believe that Assyria was about to come and kick Judah's tail. Now, Isaiah affirms that. That's true. That's going to happen. However, the enemy is not going to be allowed to touch the city of Jerusalem. All right, here's 2 Kings 19, 31 through 34. God, uh, God speaking through Isaiah, prophesying to Hezekiah. For a remnant will go out from Jerusalem and survivors from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Does that sound familiar? Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city, shoot an arrow here, come before it with a shield or build up a siege ramp against it. He will go back the way he came. He will not enter this city. This is the Lord's declaration. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant, David. And of course, it all happened exactly as Isaiah prophesied that it would. The Assyrians, meanwhile, kept their own historical record of the attempted invasion. And they recorded it the way that the museum I visited in Vietnam recorded record of the Hanoi Hotel with pictures of well-fed Americans playing badminton and stuff like at a resort. It was a bit of a revisionist history, but it inadvertently confirms through an extra biblical historical source that everything happened exactly the way that Isaiah said that it would. Take a look at the Taylor prism. This is an archaeologically bona fide authoritative source confirming that the events of 2 Kings and even Isaiah's prophecy took place in the historical record. And a convenient omission, the Taylor prism stops just short of the details about their failure to take Jerusalem, but it does brag on the black eye that they gave all of Judah. So these prophecies are audacious claims, but they're also fulfilled and they're verifiable archaeologically, even through extra biblical sources. This is one example of many. Isaiah has been simultaneously warning Judah about God's coming wrath upon them, but he's also been warning Assyria that after they would be used of God to judge God's people, they would face retribution themselves. And the same is true of Egypt. The same is true of Moab. All right, listen to Isaiah chapter 10, for example. Does an ax exalt itself above the one who chops with it? Does a saw magnify itself above the one who saws with it? It would be like a rod waving the, one who, uh, the one, ones who lift it. It would be like a staff lifting the one who isn't wood. Therefore, the Lord God of armies will inflict an emaciating disease on the well-fed of Assyria, and he will kindle a burning fire under its glory. Israel's light will become a fire and its holy one a flame. And one day it will burn and consume Assyria's thorns and thistles. You can also see one of the many glimmers of hope through which the light radiates even in this prophecy, after cutting down his own vineyard of Israel, see Isaiah chapter five, God promised to preserve a remnant for himself to bring about glorious hope after God's outpouring of discipline. You see this as well in the story of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, whose whole family structure and even the names of his kids was all used of God to prophesy what would happen in Israel. Isaiah's own children likewise bear prophetically significant names. His son, Shear Jashub means a remnant will return. His son, Maher Shalal Hazbaz, uh, Hazbaz, has a prophetically significant name as well. It means speeding the plunder, hurrying the spoil, foreshadowing the rapidly encroaching onslaught from Assyria. Fascinatingly, Isaiah also warned, warned about the Babylonian captivity. And that didn't seem likely at the time because in the world stage at the time, roughly 720 to 718 BC, Babylon didn't seem like a likely invader, but it happened exactly as Isaiah prophesied that it would. This is one of the reasons why the book of Isaiah comes under unfair criticism because its prophecy fulfillment track record is so perfect that critics out of incredulity would try to explain away its perfect prophecy fulfillment record, saying somebody else wrote that after that already happened. This book has a perfect prophecy fulfillment record, and it has prophecies that have yet to come to pass, describing what would take place at the end of days. Listen up. 
And you see a book that is able to call things before they happen, in some cases, 200 years before they even happen, even naming the person before that person was even born. And that same book has more to say about you in your living room right now. You should read what this book has to say. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 25, beginning in verse one. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have accomplished wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. By my count, there are 25 books in the Bible that contain prophecies and very arguably more than that. And these prophecies are always fulfilled. God does everything he says he will do. He once proclaimed that he would flood the earth and he flooded it. Don't bank on the idea that God doesn't really mean what he says. That is the classic folly of every person swept away in the flood. God does everything he says he will do. And he is described in Isaiah, his coming wrath upon the city of chaos, chapter 24, verse 10. That same metaphor of the city of chaos in chapter 24, verse 10 is gonna run the length of chapter 25. It's not a specific city. I mean, Isaiah has been all about naming particular cities. Look at the way that he names very specific locales throughout Moab, for example. He is using a metaphor to describe all of human evil here. Now that human evil is most typified by Moab, who is called out in the final three verses of the chapter we're studying today. But this is a warning for all peoples, for all nations, for all of human evil. A book that has been warning Judah in a way that absolutely was fulfilled in every way that we can see and even verified by extra biblical historical sources now has something to say about the bigger picture across all eras and all nations and all languages, all times. It's now pending. This is rooted in the very character of God. These prophecies will be fulfilled because their legitimacy is rooted in the character and integrity of God, which is utterly unassailable. Perfect God fulfills perfectly every prophecy he makes. And this prophecy is about you and me. It's about the world at large. Now look at verse two. For you have turned the city, remember city of chaos, into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Upon your initial reading of this text, it might even sound like the first person narrative voice speaking through Isaiah The Holy Spirit is even expressing some sort of glee over the fact that his own city is being destroyed. But remember, this is about the coming destruction of human evil. This is about God bringing the bad guys to justice. Verse two, for you have turned the city into a pile of rocks, a fortified city into ruins. The fortress of barbarians is no longer a city. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, a strong people will honor you. The cities of violent nations will fear you. My bride and I were on mission together, ministering to missionaries, ministering to pastors and their brides. And in conversation, it just came up that in the same way that I wrote a song to propose my bride, this pastor who I cannot name, and it sort of serves in a country that I will not name because he has had his face plastered everywhere by his government with these fatuous misrepresentations of what he's preaching. Okay, some of, the, some of the pastors in this room had government officials waiting on them in their offices when they got home. Um, this pastor also proposed to his bride with a song and there was a guitar nearby. So what are we gonna do? I, I took the guitar and I played my song for my bride that I proposed to her with. And it sounded like a, sounds like a, a Jack Johnson knockoff. And I sound terrible because I have bad pitch and I wrote a song that's out of my own range. Why would I do that? Uh, and then I passed the guitar over to him and my bride was sitting with me and his bride was sitting there as well, smiling on. And so he played the song that he wrote to propose to his bride, only his song given uh, uh, perfectly from his culture and his background sounded Persian with this dark mystique and harmonic minor and this haunting melody. It was absolutely beautiful. And his singing voice is just incredible. Hearing his story gave me chills every morning, every night, and other times throughout the day. While we were here, we would hear the mosques from their loudspeakers give out the Muslim call to prayer. This man with his beautiful singing voice, even as a young man, 
was honored by his mosque to take on that task. And so his voice would be the one that would sing out this call to prayer from the mosque. And so every time we heard it, he would smile and remember just what, how much God has done in his life. Because you see, there was a time when he was an aspiring jihadist. He would pray to Allah for the chance to kill people and possibly himself in the process. At one point, he was even overwhelmed with murderous rage, pitch fork in hand, a murderous rage that was directed at his own sister. You understand, if I had met this man years earlier, I would have been a prime target. But then came Jesus and everything changed. And today, that same violent man is now repentant. That same man whose voice once sang out the call to prayer now sings only, only praise songs to God and romantic love songs to his bride. That same man whose voice once uttered murderous threats now shares the gospel of Jesus Christ, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. His underground church is growing, praise God. The gospel saved lives when it changed that man's heart forever. He is a personification of exactly what this verse is describing. The cities of violent nations will fear you. A strong people will honor you. He was once just such a violent man and now he fears the Lord and everything has changed. Do you believe that God is able to do this? Christians of Highlands Community Church, it is really important to your lead pastor's heart that you believe that God is able to do this. That when you sit across the coffee table, when you sit across the water cooler from your coworker, from your family member, from your neighbor who annoys you, when you share the gospel, it's not a battle of wits. It's not about having a greater intellect than the other person and epistemologically dominating them so that they begrudgingly give their lives or cries after you've twisted their arm with words. No, no, it is a miracle of the Holy Spirit every single time someone says Jesus is Lord. Like 1 Corinthians 12 teaches, that's not possible apart from a miracle of the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot say Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. We see this in the Great Commission, the final promise that he would be with us always, even at the very end of the age. Do not write God off. Do not underestimate your God, Christian, by saying, no, that person's just too far away from God because I've seen jihadists give their lives to Christ. In my own personal evangelistic walk, I've seen Buddhists come to Christ. I've seen Mormons come to true faith in Christ. I've seen militant anti-Christian atheists come to Christ. I have seen Satan worshipers come to Christ and not one of them, not one of them ever came to Christ by a watered down gospel. Don't be afraid. This Bible says that even violent nations will fear the Lord. I once shared a guitar with a former aspiring jihadist who's now a pastor of a growing illegal church. Do you believe that God is able to do this? If you believe that God is able to do this, let that be reflected in the boldness with which you bring the gospel forward. Share the gospel just like I taught you, straight from the word of God. It won't return void. If someone's heart is hardened, that's okay. You keep on moving. Keep spreading the gospel seed. That's what we're commissioned to do. And you get a front row seat to watch God radically transform hearts that are turned against him violently. He could be doing it right now as my militant atheist friend tunes in. He could be doing it right now. Somebody from another faith system tunes in. God is able. He has said that he would do it and his prophecy fulfillment track record is perfect. So when he says that violent nations will fear him, absolutely, he absolutely will do that. He absolutely can do that. He has said that he's going to do it. So let these words bring comfort to your heart because we've seen a lot of violence lately. Do you believe that God is able to step into this present chaos and turn it into revival? It would be 100% a miracle of God if he doesn't. So he gets all the credit for it, but he already said that he will. May Seattle be counted among these cities. God is able to step into our present violence and turn it into revival. So pray with me, Highlands Community Church, that God would bring a beautiful revival here. Pray that he would, pray that he would, pray that he would. 
Romans 12, 21, do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. Look at verse four. For you have been a stronghold for the poor person, a stronghold for the needy in his distress, a refuge from storms and a shade from heat when the breath of the violent is like a storm against a wall. You'll see the stark contrast between the corrupt leaders who are named elsewhere in this same imagery of a city under siege, a city of chaos that is experiencing God's wrath and the poor who have no such refuge. God himself is their refuge. You've also seen elsewhere in the book of Isaiah wherein God is pronouncing this judgment upon Judah because of their abject at the abject poverty in their midst and their outright neglect of the poor, even cordoning off land so that it's impossible for them to have homes. This is God's judgment upon Judah and he's gonna make all things right. So this city again is metaphorical for the evil of mankind. All right, look, look at verse five, like heat in a dry land, you will subdue the uproar of barbarians as the shade of a cloud cools the heat of the day, so he will silence the song of the violent. It's a common critique of Christianity that God would just allow violence in the first place. Like God is able to stop it from the onset, so why doesn't he? But this is a futile question. I waste no time addressing questions that presuppose how things ought to be and rather address things as they are. God has allowed evil a degree of freedom. See the book of Job. See this prophecy wherein he gives parameters within which evil must remain. So the question, why does God allow evil in the first place is futile to begin with because here we are. God has allowed evil, but even evil will be used according to the glory of God. Just wait until we continue in this. But it's also hypocritical because you and I, when we sin, We contribute to that evil. We are a part of the very evil that we condemn. So when we look at evil as though it is a problem, we better be prepared to take ownership for our share in it. God allows the violent to have a song. He allows the barbarians to have an uproar. Now the barbarians chose this and God leaves them to the fruits of their own devices, which is totally fair, but there's a day coming when he will subdue it. And then watch this, the subjugation of the evil will lead to glory to God. And simultaneously, the praises of his faithful ones will also give glory to God. So both through the subjugation of evil and the praises of his faithful ones. In either scenario, it is glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. God is able to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We saw this in Romans 8. We studied Genesis in chapter 50. We see likewise that the enemy may have intended things for evil, but God can use them to bring about salvation, the saving of many lives. Whether it is evil or it is good, ultimately God is sovereign and there's a day coming prophesied in this text when he will make everything that is wrong perfectly right. It will remain so forevermore. Now, what have you got, atheism? You got nothing on this. You don't have any hope. You don't have any reason. This is a promised defeat of evil forevermore. The barbarians have their uproar. The violent, they have their song. But ultimately, even violent nations will all come to fear the Lord. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus alone is Lord. This is God's sovereign plan. It is his right to do so. Look at verse six. On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat and fine vintage wine. It was traditional after a battle victory to celebrate with a massive feast. Have you ever been to a shuhaskaria? Man, I, I, hope that I, can, I hope that there's a Brazilian district in heaven because I'm gonna go there. Brazilians know how to eat, man. Shuhaskaria is like the Portuguese word for barbecue. And it's where these skewers of prime meat, habalina and Angus beef, it's, it's all cooked over uh, either wooden coals or charcoal. And it's brought out on these massive skewers and they take it to your plate and they cut off the size of the slice that you want. And they serve it with like one of the best tasting sodas ever. It's called Guarana, which is named for a berry that we use as an ingredient, just one of many ingredients in our energy drinks. It is the whole flavor profile of Brazil's 
favorite soda. And it's probably the only soda in the world that actually the, the diet version tastes better than the regular version. So you go to a chuascaria and they bring these choice meats out to you. Just drink the Guaraná and have dulce de leche for dessert. It's absolutely amazing. There's something else that I've seen in Brazil that has blessed me. They have achieved, in my experience, across two states and several cities, beautiful racial harmony that the U.S. only aspires to. Now, that's all the more remarkable because, according to NPR, Brazil was the last country to outlaw slavery, and they traded 10 times the number of slaves that were traded to North America, imported to North America. Nonetheless, particularly the Christians in Brazil, both the wealthy in Sao Paulo, the comparatively poor in Minas Gerais, Belo Horizonte, Jaquitaí, and Montes Claros, have beautiful racial harmony. They've achieved that melting pot ideal, and it's because they identify themselves primarily by the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. It gives me beautiful hope when I see these families, many of them interracial, for example, just obliterating racism in their midst. Not only do they know how to eat, but man, the harmony that they exhibit reminds me of this text that describes a feast that is for all peoples. Did you see that? It is for the nations. It is a promised feast for all of the peoples. That's verse six. God has said that he's going to do it and he's going to do it. This is an incredible promised coming feast. Psalm 30 verse five, for his anger lasts only a, only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there is joy in the morning. Do you see the hope, my skeptical friend, in the Christian view of the end of days? The tears are temporary, but the grace lasts forever. And it's marked with a feast. Thank you, Jesus. Look at verse seven. On this mountain, he will destroy the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. He will destroy death forever. Grieving after the loss of a loved one is like a universal language. It's something that binds all cultures together. It's this dark commonality. It spans all eras, all eons, all languages, all nations, all colors. We all grieve when somebody dies. This burial shroud that's described in this text that covers all the nations and all the peoples for all time, God is going to destroy. I've got a bone to pick with death. Death took my baby boy. You've lost people too. And what do we do by the graveside? We weep because we feel overwhelmed by death, feel swallowed up by it, powerless to stop it. Grieving is a universal language across all nations. The burial shroud is deep and wide and thick, but God is going to rip it one day. Cannot wait for that day. I've seen the stark difference between the way that Christians will mourn, the way that non-Christians will mourn. But even Christians still, we're still stuck with this specter. But this beautiful promise that God will destroy death, he will destroy death forever, the first words of verse eight. In the original Hebrew, that word destroy is also translated swallow. Now this is fascinating because Isaiah was likely playing upon a common myth regarding the false god Baal or Baal, that Baal was once swallowed up by another false god named Ugarit. In the same way that Ugarit, death swallowed Baal, this prophecy shows God swallowing death. In fact, in the Greek translation in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, you could see this verse quoted, that death is swallowed up in victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, death is described as like the last enemy to be, to be destroyed and death will be destroyed forever. In Revelation's prophecy, it's like death is personified and then cast into a lake of burning soul for forever where God mocks death as it falls. Where, oh, death is your victory. Where, oh, death is your sting. That day is coming. He will destroy the burial shroud forever. He will destroy death forever. Look at verse 8. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth for the Lord has spoken. 
The Lord has spoken. The Lord God, the text says, will wipe away our tears. He himself will be the one who ministers to us. That is exquisite. That is beautiful. Remember, the, the, the prophecy fulfillment record of this book is perfect. At long, at long last on that day, every single tear that you've ever cried, Christian, will be wiped away by the Lord God himself. He has spoken. It is written. His prophecies are as good as his character, and his character is utterly unassailable. He has spoken, Christian. Do you believe him? I do. I cannot wait for that beautiful, sweet day. When death is destroyed forever, my son's going to be there. I can't wait for you to meet him. My skeptical friend, I pray that you're there, that you give your life to Christ today. And that as we read this, you read a prophecy about your own future where the Lord God himself will wipe away every one of your tears. But you got to give your, put your faith in Jesus today. You got to confess sin. You've got to repent. You got to be saved. You got to be saved. You got to be saved. The very next chapter, Isaiah chapter 26, is this beautiful song of celebration in Judah as God is going to do this. The closing verses of this text describe his coming wrath upon Moab that is just going to swim in the filth of their own evil and wickedness, but God is going to redeem his people. In chapter 26, there's this beautiful prophecy about how the dead will rise Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for you will be covered with the morning dew. The earth will bring out the departed spirits. Go, my people, enter your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until the wrath has passed. For look, the Lord is coming from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth will reveal the blood shed on it and will no longer conceal her sin. This is a prophecy about God making everything that is wrong right. And all of our disgrace, all of the evil that we call out, we are complicit in because every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So away with the hypocrisy, confess sin and see your reflection in the very evil that assails. As you condemn evil, you condemn yourself because just like me, be honest, you've sinned too. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And when sin fell on us, death entered the picture. We have this slope in our driveway and my kids use it every day like a roller coaster. My wife and I are sitting on the deck and there's this hurricane of blonde curls as my baby girl, Autumn Grace, who seems utterly unconvinced that she's only three and not yet ready to do the same stunts her brothers do, goes flying down the hill on a skateboard. We heard the wheels scrape on the asphalt. We knew what was coming, the telltale pause before the cry, and we were already running to get to her. We scoop her up, held her close. I held her right here and kissed her tears away. We bring her inside and my wife bandaged up her knee and she was home. She was broken by a fall, but her father brought her home. You and I have been broken by a fall. Nothing's been quite right since sin into the picture. Sin has this way of just ruining everything. We've been broken by the fall, but this is a prophecy of the Lord God coming to wipe every tear from our eyes to replace our disgrace with his grace. This is a promise. This is a prophecy. And it is as good as God himself. He will remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth for the Lord has spoken. He has spoken, Christian. The verdict is already done. The, the gavel has been hit. It is already decided. It is already prophesied. Your disgrace is going to go away. My disgrace is going to go away. God's going to make everything that is wrong right. The tears, they're just temporary. The grace lasts forever. Here's how John on the island of Patmos echoes this beautiful prophecy. It is absolutely exquisite. It's absolutely incredible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. We've seen this where the church is all referred to as the bride. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Crying, grieving, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. The one seated on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. He also said, right, because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega 
Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give freely to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. My skeptical friend, come and drink and drink deep the grace and be redeemed and have all of your tears wiped away by your Savior who on the cross, Jesus, has paid the full price for your sins. On that day, on that Beautiful, amazing day. We will say, look, it is our God. Continue in the text as we close. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth for the Lord has spoken. On that day, it will be said, look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This day is coming. When you tell somebody to look and see, they look. And then they see on that day. When you say look, they will look. And when they see, they will see God. Look, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. Look, this is my God. And the Lord God himself will wipe away every last tear that you have cried. The tears are temporary, but the grace is forever. It is prophesied in Isaiah. It is prophesied in 1 Corinthians 15. It is prophesied in Revelation. And if you're going to be there on that day, I want you to follow the Holy Spirit's prompting on your heart right now to give your life to Jesus Christ, that God himself would wipe away every tear. There is hope. There is hope. And it's only in Jesus. Christian, you know what to do. You practice a with me so that when the day comes this week, you're ready to share the gospel with someone who is currently violently opposed to God, but by the power of God will one day fear him. So here it is, my skeptical friend, pray with me right now. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Meet my son. Meet your Lord and Savior. Be there on the day that death is forever destroyed and let the Lord God himself wipe away every last tear. Are you ready? This is your moment. Pray with me. Share this with others on social media so they can hear the gospel right now. God, I believe that this prophetic word is true. I believe, oh God, I believe it, that you will wipe every tear from the eyes of those who love you. I believe that you love me, God. I, I believe that you love the world so much that you gave your one and only son that if I would believe in him, I wouldn't die but have everlasting life. I confess, God, that I'm a, a part of the very evil that I condemn, that I have sinned and I've fallen short of the glory of God. I confess it. I confess that the wages of my sin is death, but I believe this text. I believe that you will one day destroy death forever. The death will be swallowed up in victory, that you will tear the burial shroud, God. I confess that the wages of my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus I believe you, Jesus. You're the only way. I believe you when you said yourself, you are the way and the truth and the life. And there's no way I can come to God the Father except through Jesus. So right here and now, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Would you say it out loud right now? Say, Jesus is Lord. Say it. Jesus is Lord. And type it in the comments. Let people know it's on your heart. Jesus is Lord. God, I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead. Now, God, let me be saved. Let me be saved. Let me be saved. I cannot wait until that day when you yourself, the Lord God, will wipe every tear from my eyes. The tears are temporary, but the grace, the grace is forever, forever, forever. There is hope, and his name is Jesus. Thank you for saving me, oh God.